What up, mate? I'm Leon, the Paperback Maniac, here with another vintage paperback book review. Today, we are taking a look at The Sucking Pit by Guy N. Smith. This book was first published by New English Library in 1975, though the edition I'm holding in my hands is the 1989 reprint by Grafton Books. I will begin by reading the synopsis from the back cover. Nothing ever gets out of the sucking pit alive. On the night Tom Lawson died, something very strange happened to his sweet, virginal niece, Jenny. It was as if the black, evil spirit that resided in the old man's heart passed into her, charging her Romany blood with new powers and satanic sexual appetites. Indeed, the hunger for men was only surpassed by the insatiable pit that waited in the middle of the quote-unquote hanging wood. It, too, devoured men whole. In an orgy of murder, mutilation, and orgiastic violence, Jenny and her giant gypsy lover Cornelius would stop at nothing to regain the ancient Romany burial site of their ancestors. Only one man stood in their way, Jenny's old boyfriend, Chris, though even he wasn't prepared for the horror of the final confrontation at the quicksand lip of the sucking pit. Damn! What a synopsis, right? Now, if that doesn't want to make you go out and get this book right now, I don't know what you're doing watching this video, <laughs> you know. Um, okay, so this book, uh, we are introduced to the character of uh, Tom Lawson, a quote-unquote swarthy man of gypsy origin who lives by himself in this dilapidated cottage in a forest glen. Now, at the start of the book, uh, he observes a pack of hounds who have been chasing a fox get caught in the titular sucking pit, which is kind of like this bog uh, from which nothing can escape, uh, near his, his forest cottage. And as he watches these hounds sink into it, uh, he smiles with gratification because, you see, Tom Lawson is filled with hatred and spite for the gentry and for the quote-unquote bluted plutocrats who rule the land. Uh, and, you know, he's filled with just malicious anger, um, and, you know, he loves it when things go down into the sucking pit. He's actually used the sucking pit uh, to dispose of things himself in the past, such as the mutilated, dismembered remains of his much younger gypsy wife, whom he had found was kind of screwing all the young men in the village, and, uh, you know, who had to be taken care of, of course. Uh, another victim had been one of the, uh, uh paramours of said, uh, wife, a guy whose skull he had cleaved in two and kind of tossed in there. And, and, you know, he would kill them all, he says, if he could. You know, all of the villagers. He's just, you know, a very, very angry man. Um, so the only person really in the world that he gives a shit about is his niece, Jenny. Uh, he's got a niece named Jenny Lawson, who, um, you know, he finds is not like all these other whores, you know, who go whoring out. Uh, you know, she she's a, a pure woman, uh, virginal, as it says in the synopsis. She may even be a virgin, he thinks, at 25. Um, you know, and also not to mention, you know, she's a, she's a, she's a, not a bad looking girl. You know, he doesn't like to think of her that way, but he can't help it. I mean, Jenny, Jenny Lawson is not a bad piece of ass, according to, uh, to Tom Lawson and pretty much anyone else that sees her. So... Uh, uh, and, you know, one thing that he loves about her is that she does come and visit him in this kind of creepy uh, forest in the Midlands of England, um, you know, and she, she goes, you know, she's got nothing to gain, but she goes and visits him, tends to him, um, you know, but she doesn't like it. So at the start of the story, actually, she is going to uh, Hopwiss Wood is the name of the forest where uh, Tom Lawson lives. And she's kind of getting, she's a little creeped out, you know, because it is a kind of a scary and ominous wood. Um, she had asked her boyfriend, Chris Latimer, uh, to come with her, but even he had refused. You know, he he finds, he, he just never liked this, this uncle of hers, this Tom. He thinks he's kind of a creep. So she's going by herself. You know, she shows up, all is still in the glen. Uh, she can't hear anything. She knocks on the door, no one answers. When she enters, she finds uh, her uncle, Tom, uh, collapsed at the foot of the stairs, stricken by an apparent heart attack. 
and she rushes to him and she says, oh, uncle, oh my God, let me, you know, let me, let me fetch a doctor for you. And he just shakes his head and, you know, he croaks, uh, no, go upstairs to my bedroom, uh, grab the little black book. There's a black book near my bed. So, you know, she, she, uh, complies and she leaves the, 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 the dying man, goes upstairs, uh, you know, is filled with this uh, cloying evil odor all through his bedroom, finds this black book among the rumpled sheets of his bed, brings it back down, and of course, by the time she's made it back downstairs, uh, Tom Lawson has perished. He has shaken off this moral coil. Um, and an interesting thing happens at that moment. You know, Jenny, she's looking upon her uncle's, uh, dead body. Her first instinct, of course, is to, you know, call the police, call a doctor. But then she kind of hesitates for a minute. She thinks, you know what? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm suddenly very comfortable here in this cottage. I think I'm going to spend the night here. So she lights a cigarette in the, uh, the quote unquote Stygian gloom of the cottage and makes herself comfortable. And in fact, she decides to hang around even after that, you know, and, and the, the landowner, uh, a fat man named Clive Rollins, uh, the landowner for whom uh, Tom Lawson had worked in this wood, he's at first, of course, incredulous when he finds out that this hot, this sexy young woman who's apparently Tom Lawson's niece had decided to stay in the cottage overnight with the dead body. And he's even more incredulous when he finds out that she's planning to stay there, you know, for good or, you know. Uh, she says, yeah, you know, I really have no intention of leaving this place. And, uh, you know, he tells her actually, he's like, well, look, uh, you know, that's interesting, but I got to hire another woodsman. You know, I own these woods and, uh, the woodsman is clearly going to stay in this cottage. I can't have you staying here, you know, and find another place for the woodsman. And, um, you know, well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So anyway, Jenny Lawson, uh, she starts kind of reading uh, from this black book that her uncle uh, had left. And she finds it very fascinating. There's these, it's filled, it was all handwritten by Tom and it's filled with this strange arcana. Uh, one thing catches her eye, uh, which is a, a potion, for a fertility potion for power. Uh, and, and she starts to read that and she finds that um, if she mixes uh, hedgehog blood with shrew's blood, boils it and drinks it during midnight, uh, under a full moon, naked, uh, this will complete the ritual. So she, and she's very uh, intrigued by this. She, she, you know, she thinks this is interesting. So she goes out looking. She finds a hedgehog. Uh, you know, she, she takes great relish in lancing its head with a garden fork. And then she, uh, she looks and sees a tabby outside the cottage with a shrew in its mouth. She kind of coaxes the cat, which doesn't really respond, uh, and kind of goes off. So she takes it upon herself to grab her uncle's uh, shotgun and uh, draw a bead on the cat and blow out uh, both of the cat's legs from under it uh, and then take another shot and uh, just splatter its uh, feline brain matter and uh, fur all over the pine needles. She goes and grabs this shrew uh, from the cat and she, she, uh, she goes and then later that night, you know, the saucepan is bubbling, is boiling. It's, of course, it's a full moon. She's totally naked. Uh, as soon as the blood red, uh, you know, concoction starts boiling she she can't even wait any longer you know she dispenses with niceties she just grabs it right from the saucepan and starts downing it just greedily gulping it and you know she starts getting overcome by this sensation she has to grab like the side of the table for support her whole body is juddering and you know blood is leaking from her mouth trailing down to her breasts she starts touching herself you know very sexual and then suddenly she feels amazing. She feels like she's like basically awoken. She's living for the first time. And the one dominant need that overpowers her at this moment is a need for men. And we're talking real men. We're not talking like pansies, like her sissy ass boyfriend, Chris, back in the city, who wouldn't even come out to the force with her. She needs men like capital, all caps men, men who will dominate her the way that she feels a woman uh, needs to be dominated. So, you know, she realizes that she's not going to probably be finding men like that out in these rural woods. So she goes out to the city. Uh, she goes out to the city, uh, goes into an alley behind a cinema, uh, you know, leans back against the brick wall, lights up a cigarette. She kind of like unbuttons the top two buttons of her blouse, kind of spreads her legs. She remembers a saying that her uncle Tom Lawson had told her back in the day, which was, um, if you want to catch the, the prey, you're going to have to use the right kind of bait. 
And so, uh, you know, this Jenny Lawson knows what kind of bait she needs to use, you know, to attract her prey. So she's out there, she's kind of, you know, showing her wares, and then a man approaches, a, a tall a uh, man, uh, a, a black man, whom she later uh, refers to as a quote-unquote hulking brute, uh, cringe. But this black man approaches. She thinks, okay, this this guy will do, and so she tells him, you know, what the price is going to be. Like, you know, she ain't giving this shit for free. And uh, they go behind the alley. They start they start doing it. They start doing their thing. He finishes, of course, way too fast for her. She wasn't even like starting to get ready, uh, like to, to be satisfied. Uh, and then we kind of, we get into, uh, she wants to clearly go again. We get into the mind of this, this man for a moment who thinks, God, like I, I, this is such a hot woman. I'd love to do it again, but I drank too many beers. Like it's just not going to happen. So, you know, Jenny quickly realizes that this guy's not going to satisfy her. Uh, so she takes out, uh, her pen knife. She has a little knife that her Tom, uncle Tom had given her as a birthday present, uh, back, uh, a few years ago. She tells him to like take out his thing again. She wants to look at it. So the man complies, you know, he takes it out and Jenny moves so fast, he goes for, she goes for it and just slices the thing clean off. Just like, just, and in fact, uh, I wrote a little quote down here. So, uh, yeah, she goes, she has her knife, she goes for it and quote, the tiny blade rose and fell in one flowing sweeping movement. Steel met soft flesh, bit deep and then was free again. So this poor guy, you know, he's uh, he, he, he's got both hands pressed to his crotch. He's trying to suppress the blood flow. Jenny coldly turns away and just walks off out uh, of the alley into the night, you know, as police sirens are, are, are screaming through the night. And, um, and this is kind of the start of, of Jenny's change. She has changed from this sort of modest, sort of virginal, pure... Uh, woman, sweet girl Jenny, who'd visit her uncle and had a boyfriend and a job in the city. Now, you know, she has quit her job. She, she goes and, you know, her boss is incredulous that she's just like, uh, unceremoniously just quitting without even giving them any notice. She was like a typist for some like firm in the city. She quits. She moves in permanently into the cottage. Uh, this brings us back. So the, the, the landowner, Clive Rollins, this fat man, he's like, well, look, uh, you know, what do you, I can't have you just live here. You know, this, this is for the woodsman. And she says, well, you know, and she's filled now with this newfound sort of, uh, sexual energy and power. She kind of like, you know, like parts her legs and kind of shook, gives him a glimpse and says, well, I wouldn't, you know, in, imagine to, to stay here for free. She's like, you know, I'm going to be here all the time for you. She's like, she's like, anytime you want, you just come on by. And, you know, Clive is like, what the hell? And, but then he thinks about his own uh, sexually sort of unsatisfying relationship he has with his wife and thinks like, damn, you know, it might not be bad to have a hot little piece of ass here just waiting for me at the cottage whenever I want. And so he, he acquiesces. He says, you know what, girl? He says, fine. You know, you want to stay here for a little bit? I think we can, we can manage that. And then she says, well, you know, but I'm also going to need a little money, right? Like I'm going to need some, some, like an allowance to get by. So she, so, you know, he's, he's basically, uh, putting her up there and, um, you know, uh, giving her, giving her an allowance. And, um, so eventually, uh, another man comes across the cottage and she meets a man named uh, Cornelius. Cornelius is the uh, revered uh, leader of the gypsies for whom, with whom, you know, I mean, she has this gypsy blood too, right? Like Tom Lawson and, and her, they are uh, kind of descendants of the gypsies. So this giant gypsy uh, comes by one day, asks for Tom Lawson. She tells him he died and uh, and then when he finds out, um, I forget how, somehow he finds out that she had been reading from this book, this black book of Tom's, and Cornelius, the gypsy leader, gets furious, irate, and this is kind of a scary dude, you know, he's a big, uh, like, you know, tall man, he looks, uh, the author describes like he could be a relative of Frankenstein's monster, he gets furious. He says, oh my God. He's like, that book is, uh, the, uh, you know, he wasn't even supposed to write in that book. This is uh, like containing all of our gypsy secrets that has to be kept, uh, you know, secret. And he even takes the book and throws it in the fire, you know, but Jenny tells him, well, look, I am a relation to uh, uh, Tom Lawson. I'm his niece. So he finds that, okay, she does have that gypsy or Romany uh, blood in her. And then, um, when he asks where Tom Lawson currently is, and Jenny tells him, oh, he was buried, you know, we had his funeral a few days ago, he was buried in the churchyard, he, he flips, he loses it. He's like, what? He's like, no gypsy blood can ever be buried in consecrated ground. He needs to be buried 
in the sucking pit. That is the gypsy uh, sacred burial ground. And then he tells Jenny what they need to do. They're going to need to go to that churchyard and uh, exhume the corpse of Tom Lawson and then properly inter him in the sucking pit. And, you know, she, she's kind of horrified for a moment, but they go, you know, they go with their shovels to the churchyard. Uh, Tom Loss, or uh, Cornelius, this gypsy king, is, is digging up the corpse. Uh, unfortunately, this vagrant who is kind of just, uh, you know, in the cemetery, just, I don't know, sleeping or something, he comes across them, total, you know, wrong place at the wrong time. Unfortunately, you know, he gets, uh, you know, cleaved in with a skull and, uh, you know, taken to that sucking pit. And... Uh, they do uh, f finally exhume uh, Tom Lawson, take him back to the titular sucking pit, and there is an amazingly pulpy scene where Tom Lawson is kind of standing there at the edge of the pit uh, with both of his hands. Uh, I think he's even like lifted up like Tom Lawson. He's holding him uh, straight up ahead of his ahead of him, and you know it's misty as hell. This swirling mist, this transparent blue cloud forms in front of him, and he's chanting. And it's just like something. It just gave me so much happiness to read that. It was like something right out of like a pre-code horror comic, like some you know like some EC or Warren comic. It was it was great. Um, so they, they do they do bury him, and then you know Cornelius tells Jenny that it is fate. He and she are meant to sort of lead the gypsy people uh, to restoration and glorification. And really, what needs to happen? You know, the gypsies have been like one of the most persecuted people you know, of all time. And they are kind of wanderers. So what Cornelius says is that they need to make this woodland kind of like a sanctuary for the Romani people, for, for these gypsies. And what she needs to do is continue to use her sexual influence on the landowner, Clive Rollins, and, uh, you know, maybe convince him to, to even include uh, Jenny in the will uh, and then get rid of him, you know, maybe, you know, just fuck him hard enough that gives him to, to give him a heart attack and dispose of him. But then they will be left this land, which will be for the gypsy people. So that's what she's going to do. And, uh, you know, so that's and she's working on that. So she's working on getting uh, this this landowner to leave her the land for the gypsies. And, you know, so the landowner is going and, and, and screwing her like basically every day, of course, you know, his wife. Meanwhile, he's got a wife um, who su suspects that maybe something is amiss and that he and she suspects actually that he is screwing the strange woman who just like took up residence in the former wood, woodsman's cottage. And so she, she hires a private investigator to snoop, snoop around. When he mysteriously vanishes, uh, she decides to take matters into her own hands. And she teams up, actually, with Chris Latimer, uh, Jenny Lawson's uh, ex-boyfriend, the, the dope whom she had uh, unceremoniously left. Um, and, in fact, I don't think I mentioned, but, yeah, at one point he had come to the cottage to try to get her and bring her back. And she had just totally spurned him and just, you know, completely, uh, com completely just, uh, just disrespected him, impugned his manhood, said, look, I need men. I don't need a little boy like you. Get the hell out of here. You know, go find a nice pure girl or, or go, you know, get some prostitutes and get some experience and come back. She had totally, and he was just flabbergasted. He's like, what, who is this? This isn't my pure Jenny. Like who, how, how can you act like this? Who changes so fast? Like their personality. So this uh, Chris uh, kind of gets together with the wife of the landowner. They both suspect some strange stuff. And they, you know, they team up to kind of get to the bottom of this. And, of course, it isn't, you know, it's in a matter of seconds, of course, uh, true to this book. When Chris, you know, sees her, he, he uh, the wife of the landowner, he's wondering, hmm, I wonder what she's like in bed. Like, this is, you know, she's not a bad piece of ass herself. And, of course, they, they, they have a sexual relationship. And it's, it's you know, within 24 hours that they're avowing their uh, undying love for each other. And that once they get to the bottom of this, they're going to go away themselves. And um, so, so, yes. Uh, this book, okay, I, um, I knew that... I was going to like this book, you know, before I started it. It's one of those things I had heard so much about this book. As you can see from the quote there from uh, the king himself, an all-time pulp horror classic. Uh, you know, it's funny. I I used to think, and, and it's such a British book too. Th this book uh, it would not have been written in the U.S. It's just, it, it is uh, a, a, a typical British nasty uh, from, but a very early one, you know, I think this even predates, 
it might even predate James Herbert's The Rats. I don't remember when that was written. It's a different type of book. It's not an animal attack book. But but this reminds me why I love those British pulp nasties so much. Just completely going for it, just over the top, tasteless as all hell. Uh, you know, and I used to think that uh, Pierce Nace's Eat Them Alive. Uh, also from, you know, the 70s, late 70s. I used to think that Eat Them Alive was the trashiest book I had ever read. And that's probably still the case. However, this one definitely gives it a run for its money. This might be a very close number two. Although, of course, this book is infinitely better than uh, Eat Them Alive. Much better written. Uh, that book was almost unreadable in terms of its like prose, but this this one's much better written and just overall just way way more entertaining. Um, however, they they are both. It did remind me just in its trash factor, um, but just compulsively readable. I read this thing in a handful of hours on a flight from Orange County to Denver, Colorado, like I, like under three hours. I mean, I devoured this book, and I'm a slow reader. I usually take my time, but I just couldn't put it down. Um, Amazing gore, um, wonderful violence, titillating and cheesy as hell sex scenes that were amazing. Um, awful yet amazing, uh, brilliant dialogue in its pulp horror, uh, you know, way. Just really a, a fantastic, a fantastic book. Um, really, really enjoyed it, and it definitely has me excited to continue uh, catching up with Guy and Smith. As you guys may have seen in a recent um, uh, update of UK books that I've been buying, I, I recently stocked up on a lot of Guy and Smith books, and uh, yeah, this, this totally uh, scratched my itch, and I am really eager to continue and see what else uh, Guy and Smith has to offer because what what a maestro what a pulp horror maestro uh, blew me away these this is the type of book that this channel is all about uh, you know makes no bones about it's it's horror uh, this is like the equivalent of like a like a BB movie uh, trashy as hell and I love it so highest recommendation for sucking uh, the sucking pit by Guy and Smith so yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the review. Um, yeah, I will see you pretty soon. I think, um, I'm thinking maybe Friday or Saturday. The, the, by the end of the week, I'm gonna have another collection video. I'm gonna do a little author showcase. You may be surprised by who the author is, some of you. Uh, let's just say uh, he was a very um, a prolific author, a very prolific author. And I'll even give another hint. Uh, he's from the Midwest. Uh, he's from the American Midwest. Prolific as all hell. I have a lot of his books. Uh, I'm going to show them to you guys. So, yeah, look out for that. Uh, thank you for watching, as always. Uh, I will see you guys later. Peace out.